Okay, well, thanks, Lily. Um, so th this talk is a little different from the other two. It's not about recent research. Uh, this is actually more sort of a survey of math from about 10 years ago. Um, it kind of fits very well with uh, Sarah Pelusa's lecture on Monday, for those of you who are there. Um, so there she was uh, um, using a very recent, uh, talking about a very recent application of the methods of high order Fourier analysis. And so now this is kind of like a prequel to that talk, um, sort of ex explaining sort of the, the basics of this theory and how it developed from like 10 years ago. Um, and what I, the way I chose to frame it was, um, so high order Fourier analysis is a generalization of classical Fourier analytic techniques, which in analytic number theory go by the name of the circle method. Um, but when you look at um, treatments of higher order for analysis, they look quite different from the way that the circle method is presented. So I, I wanted to try to bridge the gap by uh, talking about circle method problems, but using the language of higher order for analysis. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on really, this talk is going to be kind of a little bit fuzzy and informal. Um, there's not going to be too many precise theorems. Um, it's more just sort of an impression of uh, uh, the type of tools that that go in, just to sort of give you an idea of, of uh, the type of things we do. Um, so any, anyone in the audience who's already sort of expert in high order Fourier analysis, they won't, they won't see much that's new. This is, this is really um, uh, a, an expository talk. Okay, so, um, right, so the circle method, of course, was developed by Hardy and Littlewood about a, a century ago. Uh, and it's used, um, well, one of his main uses is to, is to count solutions to equations, um, uh, particularly to um, uh, equations uh, in number theory. Uh, so a very typical problem that a circle method can answer is uh, you pick a large number n uh, and you ask how many uh, primes are there up to, how many arithmetic progressions of primes are there um, of length three uh, up to some large threshold n. Um, and one can answer this. And so almost 100 years ago, uh, Van der Korp had ca calculated that, that the answer is uh, n squared over log cubed n times a constant plus a small error. And the constant is some explicit um, product over primes called the singular series, and it's, it's some number you can compute. Okay, so this is a very typical um, uh, question that you can answer by the circle method. Uh, but it's important as length three. It turns out that for length four or higher, the circle method doesn't work. Um, all right, now, how is the circle method normally presented? Um, so um, the, um, the first thing you do is that you, you rewrite this analytically. You, um, uh, instead of counting solutions to, uh, to some problem, you, you, you evaluate some sum. Um, so th there's an equivalent form of van der Korpert's result. Um, so instead of talking about the primes, you, you place the primes with some function. And it turns out uh, that a, a good function to choose is something called the von Mangold function. Um, and so you, you, you take the von Mangold function, which basically uh, is something like a, a normalized indicator function of the primes. You normalize it, you truncate it to numbers less than n, and you compute a certain double sum. Um, you sum over. Uh, f of n, f n plus r, f n plus 2r. So this is basically trying to count uh, progressions n, n plus r, plus 2r, progressions on the length 3. Um, and it turns out that um, van der Kolbert's theorem is equivalent to saying that this sum has a certain uh, asymptotic um, size. It's, it's this funny constant times n squared plus a small error. All right, so uh, that's just rephrasing the problem um, in terms of a sum. Um, and then um, um, using um, the identities of Fourier analysis, you can rewrite the sum as an integral over the unit circle, which we're going to write additively as just the unit interval from zero to one. Um, so there's a very standard calculation that says that the sum that we're trying to compute is the same as a certain integral of an expression involving a certain exponential sum. Um, and the exponential sum is basically the Fourier transform of this von Mangold function. You, you take this von Mangold function and you multiply by these linear phases, uh, e to the two pi i times minus n alpha, and you get all these exponential sums and you, you take some integral um, expression of, of this sum. So you've converted the problem of, of trying to uh, um, compute a sum to that of computing an integral um, over this unit circle. Um, and then it turns out that, that uh, you can actually pretty much compute what these um, exponential sums are. Um, so there's, there's some um, alphas for which you can compute them quite precisely and those are called major arcs. Um, so when alpha is close to a rational a over q, with small denominator, like if it's close to one, one third or one half or two thirds, then it turns out that you can compute these sums quite accurately. And so you, 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 you can compute um, this integral quite, quite sharply on, um, uh, on a, a reasonable portion of the circle called the major arcs. Um, and then there's all these leftover um, 
regions where alpha is not close to a rational small denominator, those are called minor arcs. Um, and if you're lucky, uh, the minor arcs are not uh, very, uh, they don't give a very big contribution. Their contribution is smaller than, um, than the major arcs. And there's various ways to, to, to try to prove that. Um, and and if, if that all works, you can put it all together and you can get a good asymptotic for the sum. And this is how you, uh, you attack this problem. Um, okay, so that's the circle method in a nutshell. There's many, many details. For example, I'm skipping over how exactly you define major and minor arcs. It varies from problem to problem. But this is sort of how um, uh, the, uh, the theory is presented normally. And um, some of the, uh, the, the step that is very prominent in this method is this identity that turns a sum, uh, some sort of combinatorial sum, into um, um, some expression involving exponential sums. All right. Um, but this method doesn't always work. Um, and I, you can try it for many, many problems. But, uh, but what often happens um, when you do this is that you can split between major and minor arcs, but it turns out that the um, major arcs you can often still compute. Um, but the minor arc terms uh, can often, uh, you can't control very well. And the error on the minor arcs can often exceed the, um, the, the, the value that you get from the, the contribution of the major arcs and you, you don't get any um, non-trivial bound. For example, you, uh, often you can't even prove that the number of, let's say progression of length four is even non-negative, which is a trivial um, without combinatorially, but, the, but it's one that the circle method can't currently um, establish. And many of the most sought after uh, problems in additive number theory, such as the twin primes conjecture or the build back conjecture, um, they don't, they don't, um, they're out of reach of the circle method. Um, they need fantastically good bounds of minor arcs that are way better than what we can hope to achieve. Um, also, um, um, what makes this more complicated when you apply the circle method often is that you, here you just get integral over a single frequency, uh, but for general patterns, what often happens is you get integral over multiple frequencies. Um, and then it becomes, it's not even clear what major and minor acts mean, um, but it, that also makes the problem more complicated. Okay, um, and so you, you see this as soon as, for example, you start counting progressions of length four. So, um, um, so in order to handle these more complicated patterns where the, circle, the classical circle method doesn't apply, um, we, have, we now have this, this theory called higher order Fourier analysis, um, which I want to describe here. So the, um, uh, the philosophy uh, of higher order Fourier analysis is that every problem, that, every counting problem that you have, you know, counting progression of the three, counting how many times you can sum, represent numbers of sum of four other numbers or whatever, um, every counting problem has um, attached to it a certain number called the complexity. Um, so uh, some problems are complexity one, some problems are complexity two. Um, and the, uh, this complexity determines which flavor of um, Fourier analysis you should be using. Um, this um, I'll, I'll say a bit more about what complexity means later, but it sort of measures which portions of your counting problem give um, negligible contributions and which ones give important contributions. Um, and the higher the complexity, the fewer terms are non-negligible and the, the more terms are giving important contributions and it, it makes the problem more complicated. Um, so this is a number called the complexity. Um, the circle method uh, tends to tackle questions which, are, which are, it's very good at tackling questions that are complexity one. Um, and complexity one, roughly speaking, means that contributions that come from linear phases, these Fourier phases like E to the alpha n, those are the most important um, contributions to, uh, to whatever expression you're trying to, to calculate. And anything which is not correlating the Fourier phase is negligible. Um, and the sample question of counting progression length three is a very um, typical example of a complexity one problem. Um, there are some problems that are easier than complexity one. There's a few problems that are called complexity zero, um, where, which, which are similar to complexity one problems, except that it's only the major arc Fourier phases that are important. So basically only periodic functions uh, give any trouble at all. And then anything which is uh, uh, um, not periodic, for example, an, uh, a Fourier phase of a very irrational alpha, um, it turns out to be negligible. Um, so these problems are very simple. Um, those you can also handle by the Fourier, by the circle method. Sometimes you can also handle them by more elementary methods. Um, a good example of a complexity zero question is how many primes up, um, uh, how many pairs of primes really up to n differ by a perfect square? Uh, okay. But there are questions of higher complexity. Um, so um, yeah, so for example, uh, counting progressions of length four, that turns out to be a complexity two problem. Um, and there, it's not just linear phases like e to the alpha n that you have to um, um, 
uh, handle the, con the contributions of there's, there's also higher order versions of linear phases such as, such as quadratic phases e to the alpha n squared um, and then more generally these these slightly scary sounding things called null sequences which i will mention a little bit later um, and so some problems are complexity too and then for those we now know that the correct tool is quadratic Fourier analysis if a proper complexity is three you need to pull out cubic Fourier analysis and so on and so forth um, and unfortunately, um, even with high order Fourier analysis, some problems are still out of reach. There are some problems of, of infinite complexity where lots and lots of um, components of your sum you're trying to compute are non-negligible. And so even high order Fourier analysis cannot touch them. Um, and sadly, some of the most uh, desired questions in, in analytic number theory are in this category, uh, for example, the, the twin prime conjecture, which I have, um, would have loved to have made progress on for many, many years, but uh, the high order Fourier analysis is not enough by itself. Okay, so the, every problem comes with a complexity and we have a pretty good understanding of what, uh, what complexity to assign to each problem. Um, it's not an entirely trivial issue. Uh, there was a conjecture uh, on exactly what um, complexity, every time you have a system of linear equations, there should be a certain uh, complexity attached to it. Um, this was a conjecture of Gowers and Wolf uh, from about 15 years ago. Um, Ben Green and I thought we'd proved it uh, about uh, 12 years ago. Uh, it turned out there was a tiny gap in our proof, which was only fixed this year. Um, so, uh, uh, but okay, but so, but we do pretty much understand um, what the what this concept of complexity. All right. Um, now, when you look at um, a paper doing something in high order Fourier analysis, it doesn't look like the circle method. Uh, it, um, all the language is different. All the notation is different. Um, and um, one reason for this is that um, the circle method, when it's normally presented, it relies very, very much on uh, identities. So there's all, these, all these wonderful identities in Fourier analysis. For example, the Plancharot identity, the Passivore identity, the inversion formula, um, the, the formula relating convolutions to, to Fourier transforms and so forth. Um, so there's all these wonderful identities, which we just use over and over again, whenever we do classical Fourier analysis. Um, but uh, one of the first things you, rec you, you uh, realize when you go to quadratic or higher Fourier analysis is that all these identities go away. Um, there is no quadratic Plancharot identity. There is no cubic Fourier inversion formula, um, which is very frustrating. Uh, we have looked for many years to find such identities. Uh, and as far as we know, there aren't any useful identities. We find some useless ones, uh, but they're, 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 there's not ones that can actually uh, are good for estimating things. Um, and in fact, my belief is that they just don't exist. Um, so uh, we have to uh, do Fourier analysis in a way that avoids identities uh, because we don't have them anymore. Um, so we use other tools and, and they go by names such as uh, inverse theorems, equidistribution theorems and transference principles. Um, and so, and these are the tools that end up um, being usable in, in the high order case. Um, so that makes the higher order theory look different from um, the classical um, circle method theory. Um, but it, that, that's, that, that's really just kind of a change of perspective. Um, as, so th what I wanted to, to talk about today is that you can also um, uh, revisit the circle method using these sort of higher order tools. And you can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can recast, you can reframe the circle method in a way that resembles the higher order uh, theory. So I thought this might be uh, some way to sort of introduce the higher order theory to people who haven't seen it before. Um, now, you do give up something when you lose the identity. So, so the, these Fourier identities are very good at giving very precise answers. So, um, like if you want really good control and error terms um, and, and very uh, nice asymptotics, um, identity-based methods are, are the way to go. Um, but um, these other tools, inverse theorems and so forth, um, they're not as strong as identities. Um, I mean, it's, a sort of, it's sort of natural, right? I mean, given a choice between an exact formula and an approximate formula, you know, you would imagine the exact formula is the stronger statement. Um, but uh, usually, uh, but they're often good enough. Um, so uh, often the most important thing in, in one of these counting problems um, is that, um, so to, uh, could someone mute themselves as some audio interference? Okay, um, so, um, the most important thing in one of these problems is to, sh is to make sure that all the error terms that you get when you count something are of lower order than the main term. Now, ideally, they would like they'd be much lower order, um, and the circle method is, is the, the identity-based circle method is is often good at getting really good um, control and error terms. But 
uh, often even just little, uh, making the error term little o of, of the error term or an epsilon times the, 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 main, the main term is, is all you need for applications. Um, you know, for example, if you just want to show that there is some twin prime or, or that there's some way to, to represent a number of sum of three squares or, or there's some arithmetic progression of length k in the primes. Um, yeah, all you need is the error term is little o of, of the main term. Um, and these sort of these tools are good enough for that, uh, 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 for that kind of application. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to walk through a typical circle method problem uh, without, uh, but, but trying to, to refrain from using um, identity. So basically trying to not use the equal sign um, uh, too much. Okay, uh, now you can't avoid it completely. Uh, you, you, uh, this one step in particular where you still need a Fourier identity, but it's only one and everywhere else uh, uh, you don't need very much. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So as I said, um, the first step whenever you, you try to deploy for a high order Fourier analysis is to figure out what your what uh, the complexity of the problem you're facing uh, is. And so uh, if, you, if you are doing a counting problem, uh, you can it's um, there's always some multilinear form that's involved, um, usually um, that, you, that you are you are counting um, some multilinear form um, applied to certain functions, which are often indicator functions. Um, so for example, if you're given some set of integers a and you, you're asking how many length three progressions are there of length, of length um, three uh, inside your set A, uh, what you're doing is that you're summing over all length three progressions, n, n plus i, n plus two r, but you're asking that they all lie in A. So really you're, you're asking, um, if you take the indicator function of A applied to n, n plus r, n plus two r, and you sum the product of those indicator functions, that product will precisely count um, um, uh, the uh, this number of, of, uh, of length three progressions. So you can write the number of length three progressions as a certain trilinear form applied to um, this indicator function one sub a three times. Um, but uh, there's really a more general trilinear form than just um, uh, this particular count where you can replace these indicator functions by more general functions. So you, you can imagine some sort of weighted, this, this kind of represents a weighted count of um, um, of progressions of length three, where the first entry is weighted by F, the second entry of the progression is weighted by G, and the third progression is, is weighted by H. And we allow F, G, and H to be positive or negative or complex. Um, so um, we allow sort of complex um, side weights. Um, and really it's this form that is, that is um, uh, running the show. Okay, and, and, and basically um, the complexity of this form controls the complexity of this problem. All right, so we have, we have a certain trial in your form and we, we want to, to evaluate it at um, a specific function. Okay, so we're changing the problem from, from combinatorics to analysis, but from changing a counting problem to a problem or estimating a sum. All right. Um, and the reason why, why this, lo this looks better is that th this looks like things that, that, that uh, this type of expression looks familiar to analysts. So it looks a little bit like a convolution. Um, and yeah, so that, and, and we have tools for dealing with, with, with expressions like this. All right. Um, now, it's, this particular form is a little bit um, um, uh, annoying to deal with because uh, like integers are unbounded. Uh, also, it's a bit weird that we're only looking at um, positive steps. We should really sort of do all steps. So I, I'm gonna change the problem a little bit. So instead of looking at this, at this form, I will look at a, um, a close cousin of this form. So we're gonna work, instead of a integers, we're gonna work in a cyclic group of some finite order. So now everything's finite. Um, and uh, for very minor technical reasons, it's convenient to end the odd, just so that I can invert this too. Um, that's not important though. Um, and so we're gonna consider um, a very slightly uh, modification of that previous form, which I'm gonna call lambda three. Um, so lambda three is a form that, that takes three functions on the cyclic group and it computes this average. So you, you take um, N and R to be uh, elements of the cyclic group uh, and you uh, take the average um, over all such n and r. So here I'm using this averaging notation. When I average a function f on a set a, um, the, the mean value on a, I denote uh, the expectation as n goes to a of, of f of n. So it's, it's, the, it's the mean of f and it's, it's, it's for n uniformly distributed um, in the set a. So we, um, we take the average for n and r in the cyclic group. And so we pick basically a random length three progression uh, in this um, cyclic group, uh, including in particular trivial progressions where r is zero. And then we just compute this, this trilinear expression. We, we, we weight the first term by F, second term by G, third term by H, and we, we get this, um, so, and take an average that gives you a number, okay? So this is a trilinear form. 
it, it inputs three functions and spits out a number. All right. Um, and what this form does is it, it, it's a normalized count. Um, like if you, if you specialize to indicator functions, it is counting basically how many length three progressions a certain set has. If you can compute this sum, you can compute, um, you can count progressions. Okay, so it, it's all about understanding the sum. And because I'm using this normalized expectation, um, it's, it's normalized in a very nice way. If, if I input in the constant functions one, 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 I just get back one. Okay, so, um, if, yeah, so if I input one, I get one. Um, and hence, if I input anything less than one, so if I, take, if I input in functions that are what are called one bounded, so the magnitude is always less than one, then just by the triangle inequality, um, this form will always be bounded by one. Okay, so if I input one bounded functions, then I will get some a, a one bounded output. Um, but what happens in the, so the, um, the the key point? And what makes this this expression low complexity is that often um, this sum is actually a lot less than one. Um, so what what often happens is that if I input in some one bounded functions into the sum, there's so much averaging going on here that often the number that gets spat out is much much less than one. So uh, let me. Uh, uh, introduce a sort of a, a slightly informal concept. Uh, I'm going to say that a function f is negligible for this average. If whenever I stick in this function f as an input in one of the, the three slots, f, g, and h, and I, 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 I stick in any two other one bounded functions um, in the other two slots. So if f um, trilinear form with any other one bounded functions, if all those forms are small, um, then I say that f is negligible. Uh, so f is somehow in some sense orthogonal to everything else that's going on in lambda three. That that um, that, it, that if f if I see a negligible function in one of these three slots, it doesn't matter if the other two functions are non-negligible. I can immediately say that that portion of this trilinear form is is very close to zero. Um, so um, having negligible functions around is, is great. Uh, what that means is that uh, you can you can add or subtract a negligible function to any of f, g, and h, and it will never change. This, this, this format very much. So um, the, um, the negligible functions, um, if you like, this is kind of a multilinear version of, of the notion of a kernel of an operator, right? If you have a linear operator, the kernel is all the functions that get sent to zero. So those are the functions that you can, you can modify the input by without affecting the output. Uh, and this is kind of the analog for a, um, a multilinear form. Okay, so uh, the negligible functions are the functions that don't uh, uh, make a difference. Uh, when you, uh, that you can add and subtract them to, to any one of the three um, um, uh, functions here, um, and it doesn't change this average. Okay. Um, all right. So that's this notion of negligibility, um, and um, basically the uh, the more negligible functions you have for a form, the lower the complexity. Okay. So as an extreme example, um, if everybody was negligible, then this form was always basically zero. Um, so that's, that, uh, I guess that's a complexity negative infinity. Um, now that, that almost never happens, but, um, yeah, but, but what often happens is that many, many functions are negligible. Um, and so the complexity is fairly low as a consequence. Okay, so uh, let's get some examples. Okay, so um, maybe I'll, I'll write this form again just for reference. Uh, where should I put it? Okay, so let's see. Oops, can I write? Okay, so what this form is, is that you're averaging over n and r, f of n, give them plus r, get you minus 2r. Okay, that's what uh, this, this form is. Okay, oops. Uh, how do I get, okay. So if, um, okay, so if g and h are one bounded, I can just use the triangle inequality. So the size of this form, I can just, I can just bound it g and h by one. I can bound this by just the average value of the um, uh, absolute value of f, which is also basically less than the L1 norm, the, the normalized L1 norm of your, your function. So, um, so one very easy example of a negligible function is that a function that's small in L1 is negligible. For example, um, the indicator function of a small set uh, would be negligible. So you, you can always sort of modify uh, f g and h on small sets, and that doesn't really change anything. Um, and that, that's kind of reasonable. Like, if, like if you want to count progressions of length three in a large set, um, adding or subtracting a, a small set uh, to that set should not change the count very much. Okay, so so that's a very easy example of a negligible function. Um, now, if if that's all there was, then uh, you couldn't do very much because L one is not compact. Um, but um, well, I guess te technically for fixed n it is compact, but it's not compact sort of uniformly in n. All right. Um, so um, 
Now, it would be nice if there were many more neg negligible functions, now, but not everything is negligible. Um, and it's because of certain identities. Um, so uh, it turns out that linear phases, so functions that form E to the alpha n, um, they are not negligible. Um, so it's possible to stick a linear phase into this form and get out something as big as one. Um, and the reason is ultimately because of this identity that um, if you take any progression n n plus r n plus 2r, there's actually a constraint um, that, uh, what, what, basically what the, the picture here, oops, is that if you take a linear function, uh, so, oh, well, okay, that, that is, if you take a linear function and you evaluate it on arithmetic progression, the values of the um, of this linear function at these three um, equally spaced points are related to each other. Right? If, if if you know what your linear function is doing at two points, you know what, what it's doing at the third. Two points determine a line, um, and the precise relation is that is this linear. There's a linear relation between the value of alpha x at n, n plus r, and n plus two r are related by this by this easy linear identity. Um, another way of thinking about this is is that the linear functions the second der derivative vanishes which means also that the second difference is vanished. And this is a second difference of, um, of this linear function. So there's a certain um, constraint relating the values of a linear function at these um, three points of the progression. And as a consequence, um, if you take f to be this function, e to the alpha n, g to be this function, e to the minus two alpha n, corresponding to, to, to this guy here, and h to be e to the alpha n again, then when you work out this expression, which I have erased, Okay. All these functions os oscillate, but because of this identity, when you when you plug in these, these sp specific choices of function f, g, and h, um, the the uh, the oscillation all cancels, and this this product is always one, and so also the average is also one. So what you see is that if you stick in this function f, um, and then you stick in these other two functions, you get back one. Um, so therefore, th this linear phase is not negligible. Okay, so this is an example of a non-negligible function. Um, now, so linear phases are not negligible. Um, more generally, anybody that has a large inner product with this linear phase is not negligible because um, you can, uh, by, the, by the same calculation, if you just set g to be this, this function here and h to be this function, uh, but you let f to be arbitrary, um, the same identity tells you that when you evaluate this linear form for these particular inputs, um, g and h, um, they cancel to the, the contribution of, of, of those two terms cancels to get e to the minus alpha n. Okay, so this is, um, so when you plug in these particular values g and h, this is just the inner product of f with, the, with this linear phase. Okay, um, and so therefore any function which has a large inner product with uh, this linear phase is uh, not negligible. Um, now in the language of Fourier analysis, what they're saying is that functions which, which have large Fourier coefficients are not neg negligible. And so therefore the Fourier coefficients are really important to this theory. And this is sort of why the circle method becomes relevant for this problem. It's precisely because the linear phases are um, sort of obstructing negligibility. All right. So, um, all right. So what we've demonstrated here is that anybody which, has a which, which correlates with a linear phase is, um, is not negligible. Uh, and, and therefore it somehow will have a voice, has a vote somehow in, in, in saying what this, this expression is. Okay, uh, but uh, what saves you is that uh, these are basically the only examples of, neg of non-negligible functions. Okay, so there's a converse statement that um, conversely, if you have a function which is non-negligible, let's say a one-bounded function, which, which, which isn't um, negligible. So uh, if, if, for example, um, if you're given that f, the trilinear form of g and h is bigger than, than some, I don't know, some, a, some eta, some fixed eta, say 0.1, uh, where g and h are one bounded. Okay, so, so if, you're, if you are non-negligible, then actually you must have, um, there exists a, 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 a phase such that the inner product of f with this phase is big. In fact, I think uh, uh, with my conventions, I think, I think you get eta squared, if you actually work it out. Um, so there's a, there's a specific um, converse, uh, and these sort of converses are called inverse theorems. They say that, that if this form is, if a function is not negligible, then it must actually, um, you can blame the non-negligibility on a linear phase. So, so every source of non-negligibility um, comes from one of these linear phases. So the, the, uh, these Fourier phases are the only things that are 
Gary, sorry to interrupt. I lost your audio. You won, and then and that's when we expect the SOCA method to be useful. Okay, so um, this inverse theorem, um, I don't know if there's any chat. Okay, yeah, so unfortunately there's, uh, uh, there appears to be some stability. Can you hear me now? Yes, All we right. can hear you now. Okay, uh, so what I just, just previously, what did I just say? Oops. Um, right, so I just said that, um, that for this particular form, lambda three, the only functions that are not negligible are the ones that, that correlate with um, linear phases. And this is called the inverse theorem for lambda three. And it's because of this that um, you basically only need to understand what, what uh, the, the linear phase contributions of um, uh, uh, to your problem uh, and you will understand everything. And this is why this, this form has complexity one and this is why the SOCO method works for, this, um, for questions involving this particular form. All right, now, how is this inverse theorem proven? Um, Classically, you prove it by an identity. Um, so uh, it turns out that, that you can write this, this form in terms of Fourier coefficients. Um, and if you take a function and you compute it, you, you, you set up a Fourier transform, it turns out that you can write this form in terms of, of Fourier coefficients. Um, and then um, um, uh, uh, each of these terms you can bound in various norms. So, so there's a Planchot identity. You can bound H g hat and H hat in, in L2 in particular using um, this Planchot identity. And as a consequence of this in Cauchy Schwartz, you can show that the only way that this term can be large is if um, f hat has a large Fourier coefficient somewhere, g hat has a large Fourier coefficient somewhere, and so forth. Um, and this is why um, uh, you can prove this, this way, you can prove the inverse theorem. All right. So, um, all right. So, so this is sort of the, the, the usual approach to proving this inverse theorem. Um, now, you can prove it in a slightly different way, uh, sort of relying a little bit less on identities. Um, so, one uh, other one bound of functions that we, we don't uh, um, uh, we don't understand. Oh, are we, am I out of audio again? Uh, Just from the start of this page. Okay. So, um, all right, so there's another way to control this form that doesn't um, rely at least immediately on as many uh, identities. Um, so um, you, you got this expression and you got one function you care about, say f, and then you got two functions that are one bounded but you don't know very much about. Um, so there's a standard way to eliminate functions that, that you don't care about, which is Cauchy Schwartz. Um, so for example, if you wanted to eliminate f, uh, I could write this, um, I could pull out the R average. Okay. And I can bound this by Cauchy Schwartz, F is bounded by one, um, and I can bound this by something like a square. Okay. So uh, you can do, do a Cauchy Schwartz thing, I have a square root, it's also needed here. So you can, you can, um, uh, you can do a Cauchy Schwartz to get rid of one of the functions f uh, at the cost of making the rest of the expression more complicated. Um, and then there's the similar ways to eliminate g or eliminate h. And if you do Cauchy Schwartz, I think twice, um, you can eliminate g and h if you do it correctly. Uh, and what you find is that you can bound this, um, um, this form by something that only involves f. Um, and there's a certain expression of f, which is called the, the Gower's U2 norm, Gower's uniformity norm of, of order two. Um, and it has a funny definition. It is, um, uh, it's the fourth root of a certain average of f of a parallelograms. So you basically you replace these length three progressions by these parallelograms. You take this certain combination of f over all these parallelograms and you take the fourth root of that. Um, and um, it turns out that you can control this trilinear uh, expression by just this, this uh, U2 norm of f. Um, it's not entirely obvious in, that this is a norm, but this, this can be proven. Um, so, um, so this type of inequality, this is um, sometimes known as a generalized one-dominant inequality. Um, 
because of this inequality, if you want to prove an inverse theorem for this form, you just need to prove an inverse theorem for this. Because um, what, is, what this inequality tells you is that if f is not negligible for lambda 3, it's also not negligible for u2. And so, um, so because of this Cauchy Schwartz observation, um, you just need to prove an inverse theorem for, for u2. That, that uh, if a function f has large u2 norm, then it has a large inner product with a linear phase. Um, now, by itself, this doesn't seem to have gained very much. You've just swapped uh, one expression with another. Lambda 3 gets replaced by this u2 norm. Um, but what, what's nice in the theory is that these, u, these Gower's norms are turned up to be universal. Uh, so there's this, a certain hierarchy of, of, of Gower's norms, u2, u3, u4, and so forth. And it turns out that every, um, pretty much every um, 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 uh, um, multivalent form like this, uh, which is not completely, uh, which is not completely degenerate, uh, any one of these forms is controlled by some of the one Gauss norm, um, and the Gauss norm that controls this form that's what determines the complexity. Uh, so it turns out that uh, if you if it's U two norm that controls the form, you have complexity one. If there's something called U three, if U three controls the norm, you have complexity two. So forth. the complexity is always one less than the order of the um, um, norm that you uh, 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 you use. Uh, the two here is because parallelograms are two-dimensional objects. All right, so you can reduce the inverse theorem for lambda three to the inverse theorem for u two. Um, now, and here's the one place where you actually need an identity. Okay, so uh, if you if you want to prove the inverse theorem for for u two, um, that we only know how to do using an identity. Um, and so it turns out that there's a very nice identity for the u two norm. The U2 norm is actually basically just the L4 norm of the Fourier coefficients. Um, and once you have that, you can pretty much immediately deduce the inverse theorem for U2, which implies the inverse theorem for, for Sorry, Terry. We have lost you from the start of this page. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So the, uh, the the U2 inverse theorem. Uh, so the way you prove it is that you you, you establish um, here is where the one the one place in the whole theory where an identity is relevant um, is important. You have to write. Um, you have to use either a Fourier identity or a trace theorem or some representation theory identity to rewrite um, uh, your U2 norm in terms of something spectral, um, such as um, Fourier coefficients. Okay. So. Uh, if you like, this is a trace formula. Um, it's a fancy name for just a Fourier identity. Uh, but um, once you have this identity, it becomes quite uh, quite clear why, um, if you have a large Fourier coefficient, the U-term should be large, and if you have if all your Fourier coefficients are small, then then uh, the U-term should be small. Um, okay, so this is this is basically the only identity you need in, in the entire theory. Um, well, I have plus plus row, I guess. Um, but uh, okay. But that, but other than that, we don't need identities. Okay, yeah. And as I said, this U two is uh, is part of a whole hierarchy of norms that that get harder and harder to understand. U three, U four, U five, and so forth. All right. So, um, all right. So we now understood that functions that have large Fourier coefficients, functions that have large inner product with linear phases, are not negligible. Uh, well, and those are the only ones. So for functions that have, which are orthogonal to um, Fourier, Fourier phases or almost orthogonal um, should be negligible. And so we should, we can throw them away and we can ask what's left. And so, um, so um, in order to formalize that, we develop what, is, what are called structure theorems, which are very general um, theorems, um, which in the context of, of, of linear phases, what, what it tells us is that you can take any function, let's say any bounded function, and you can split it into what we call a structured part and a uniform part. Uh, and the uniform part is the one that's negligible. Uh, it's going to have really small inner products with, with all linear phases. So that's, that's something called Fourier uniformity. Um, so if you like, it's kind of orthogonal to all, um, all the linear phases. Um, it can't be completely orthogonal to every single linear phase because the um, Fourier inversion formula tells you that the Fourier phases actually span the whole, um, the whole space. Um, so you can't be completely orthogonal to every single um, um, your phase, but you can be uh, almost orthogonal to almost every phase, to, to every phase. Um, so there's a uniform part, and there's the remainder, the structured part, um, and that part is um, is also um, it's, it's just um, going to be a bounded number of linear phases. It's, it's some finite linear combination of linear phases. Um, this type of decomposition has analogs all over mathematics. Um, uh, 
perhaps, uh, for example, in spectral theory, uh, you could decompose a spectral measure into a pure point uh, measure and a continuous measure, um, and that, that's a very similar decomposition. Um, it, now, in applications, uh, what's important is that you can do this decomposition in such a way that you preserve the boundedness. So if you start a bounded function, it's possible to make a decompose so that um, the structured part is just as bounded as, as the original function. That if, you, if you start bounded, you can stay bounded. So you can decompose in an infinity preserving manner. Um, and related to this, um, if you start with a non-negative function, you can also, the structured part is also non-negative. Um, those are important extra features of this structure theorem that are important for applications. If it wasn't for those extra features, uh, this would be a very easy thing to, to prove. Um, so, um, uh, well, okay. Well, first of all, uh, once you have this theorem, um, uh, the upshot is that um, all the uniform components of your functions can be can be uh, negligible; they can be thrown away. And so, if you ever want to evaluate a um, uh, a form at, at, at with arbitrary functions, you only really need to evaluate it at the structured part, and the structured part is is um, um, it's much more explicit. It, it's some finite combination of, of Fourier phases, and those uh, we, we have tools to deal with. Um, and this type of philosophy of, of reducing to structured components of the function and then computing what happens there, that is um, the aspect of the circle method that generalizes to, to, higher, um, to, uh, to higher order. Um, and so it's sort of anal analogous to like, you know, isolating the major arc contributions to, 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 your, to, uh, to a certain expression. Okay, yeah, so morally what's going on here is that, um, so again, with identities, you can kind of see why you, you would have um, um, a theorem of this type. Okay, so the Fourier inversion formula is an identity, it tells you that every function can be split up into some combination of linear phases with these coefficients, and some coefficients are big and some coefficients are small. And morally, what we're doing is that we're just collecting all the coefficients that are big, and that will be the structured part, and then all the coefficients that are small, that should be, that should be the uniform part. Um, now, that's a bit too naive. That's like not quite what we do. Um, if you just do that kind of um, Fourier truncation, uh, that doesn't preserve boundedness. If you start with a bounded function, there is no reason why the large Fourier coefficients together would be bounded in, L, in L infinity and the small coefficients also bounded in L infinity. Um, they'd be bounded in L2 by Plancherel, but not L infinity. Um, and similarly, if f is non negative, there's no reason why this, this construction would, would give a non negative um, structured part. So you don't you don't do this precisely, but you do you do something more complicated. Um, and maybe I will skip uh, uh, exactly how you do it. Um, uh, the slickest proof these days is um, you, you can prove these sort of decompositions by duality. You you apply the Hahn-Banach theorem, and uh, there's a dual statement which is easy to prove, and you prove that instead. Um, okay, but maybe I will skip uh, this slide. I'm running short on time. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, maybe I'll skip this slide too. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So you you can reduce. Uh, so every time you you want to control some sum, you can reduce it to the to the structured part. Now, for some functions, such as the Fermat function, you can compute what, what the structured component is exactly. Um, and this is why we can answer many questions about primes. Um, but sometimes you don't. Uh, you, you give an arbitrary function. You you you're not really told what the structured component is. Um, and you have, to, you have to control its contribution. And so the final um, tool, so I've, I've given you two tools already that are fundamental, the inverse theorem and the structure theorem. Um, the final third ingredient of higher order Fourier analysis that is uh, essential in, in most applications are what are called equidistribution theorems. Um, so um, as I said, the, uh, the remaining portion, the non-negligible portion that needs to be understood are the portions where um, your linear phases uh, your, your functions come from linear phases. So things like e to the alpha one n, e to the alpha two n, e to the uh, uh, two pi i alpha k n. And you have some frequencies and there's some arbitrary rule numbers. Um, and you wanna control some expressions involving these, these, um, um, these linear phases. And in order to control what these um, um, phases do, uh, you need to understand the equidistribution. So basically uh, you need to understand the joint equidistribution of alpha one n mod one, alpha two n mod two, and alpha k n mod, mod sorry, alpha one n mod one up to alpha k n mod one. Well, in other words, you are taking a vector in this uh, torus and you're taking all the dilates of this vector um, and you, you're asking, so it's basically uh, some torus here. And you have some vector alpha and you're taking multiples of alpha, two alpha, three alpha, 
so forth. And you're asking how, how do these, um, um, how does this linear orbit, uh, how does it distribute uh, in this torus? Okay, um, and we have a standard tool for understanding this, they're called equidistribution theorems. Okay, so um, the most classical such theorem is the, uh, well, it's, it's just called the equidistribution theorem, um, proven by Bohr, Vauer, and Sapinski independently. Um, and it's, um, it says that if you take um, an irrational number and you, oops, If you take an irrational number and you look at the multiples of an irrational number mod one, it's equidistributed in the unit circle. So if you take the unit circle, you take the multiple alpha, two alpha, three alpha. Okay. Um, as long as you start with an irrational number, it will spread out uniformly throughout the whole circle. So that if you, if you test the average over any um, test function, you would get just the mean value. Okay. Um, or equivalently, the, uh, the the shift by alpha is in a, a Gaudic flow on the unit circle. Okay. So. Uh, this is an e uh, easy, uh, easily proven by Fourier analysis. I won't give a proof here. Um, it's important that you're irrational. Um, I'm saying, Terry, we heard the words, it's important, it's an irrational, and then <laughs> nothing more. Uh, if you start with a rational shift, like one third, and you, you take multiples of one third, you will not equidistribute it over the unit circle, you would instead equidistribute over this uh, finite subgroup of the unit circle, the multiples of one third. But in, in either case, you equidistribute either of the whole unit circle or on some subgroup. Um, now it turns out that that's, that's a very general phenomenon um, that uh, in higher dimensions, for example, if you take any vector um, and you take, you take its orbit, its linear orbit, it will always equidistribute in some subgroup, some closed subgroup of the torus, maybe the whole torus, maybe some finite sub, um, subgroup, maybe some lower dimensional subtorus. Um, the most general thing that happens is that um, if, if you take a torus, um, you may equidistribute in a subtorus like this diagonal here, or maybe some, um, some um, um, a subtorus plus a, a finite group. Um, so I gave an example here. If you take, um, uh, if you take the vector root two, two root two plus one half, And you take the, the, the multiples of, of, of this um, uh, mod one, uh, you, you, I think you, you will equidistribute in um, the torus x2x, which, is, which looks like this, uh, plus um, also um, the, the same thing shifted by one half. That, uh, that uh, you will equidistribute in some finite union of tori. Um, okay, but but you, you always equidistribute in something algebraic. There is some algebraic subgroup of your torus which, um, uh, which describes this, 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 the equidistribution. And so you can compute all these types of limiting averages um, in terms of some subgroup. Um, and um, this is a phenomenon, uh, this type of phenomenon that the limiting distributions are always come from algebraic objects like subgroups. Um, this is something called, this phenomenon is called measure rigidity. Um, it's, it's a great topic, but I won't talk about it further here because of lack of time. Um, and so but roughly speaking, once you have this, this equidistribution theorem, um, type of theorem, you can answer all kinds of questions about um, how structured, uh, like how many progressions of three there are in a structured function or whatever, as long as you understand uh, what um, uh, closed subgroups of, of your uh, ambient group. And so um, problems basically reduced to group theory problems. You, you're basically trying to, 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 uh, to answer questions like what are all the closed subgroups of a certain V group? Um, so you know, starting from combinatorics, you turn to a, you 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 convert your problem to analysis, and then suddenly it becomes group theory, um, and and that's somehow the end game. All right. Um, now uh, I was going to so the, the, I'll, I will post the slides later, but I think I'll, I'll skip uh, uh, slides for lack of time because I want to talk about um, higher order for analysis. Okay. So uh, those are some of the, the basic inputs that uh, that go into controlling. Um, Lambda three, which, which controls length three progressions. Uh, so now let, let me briefly talk about length four progressions. If you want to count progressions of length four, um, many of the same steps that I just mentioned uh, have analogs. So instead of, of, of so instead of working with lambda three, um, there's now a, a quartile linear form called, uh, which I call lambda four, which shows up. So uh, you, you have these averages over length four progressions. Um, now lambda three was controlled by the U two norm. Uh, lambda four, if you apply Cauchy Schwarz three times. Turns out that it's controlled by a, a worse norm, a U3, uh, which is the eighth root of a certain um, average over parallel pipettes. Um, these eight points here, um, they, they form uh, 
uh, this is basically averaging over random parallel pipe beds in this in the cyclic group. Um, all right. Um, okay. So this is an expression which, which is harder to understand, uh, and the inverse the inverse theory is is much worse. Um, yeah. So like if you try to use this, the circle method, you get much worse expressions that are much harder to to, to control. Um, and um, what's going on here is that linear phases are no longer the only things that are causing problems with non-negligibility. Um, so uh, we still have this. So we, uh, previously we had this identity that uh, if you have a, a length three progression, okay, and you take a linear function, then there is a constraint. The values of a linear function are constrained um, um, on, on the three progression. And that's why linear phases are non-negligible for length three progressions. And of course, it, uh, that also means they're also non-negligible for length four progressions. Um, but now uh, also quadratic phases cause a problem. If you have a length four progression and you take a quadratic function, for example, y equals alpha x squared, um, length four uh, quadratic functions are, are also constrained when you, when you evaluate them on a length four progression because uh, the, the first three points are already determine the parabola, and then uh, you can extrapolate to form the fourth point. Um, and there's a specific linear constraint. It turns out to be, to be this constraint, that, uh, that a quadratic phase has um, its values at, at four points of an equally spaced progression uh, obey this identity, which reflects the fact that, that the third derivative of a quadratic function vanishes, so the third differences all vanish, and this is a third difference of, um, of, of this phase. And it's because of this that now quadratic phases, um, so, so functions like this, these are also um, now non-negligible. So these also cause problems. Um, but, you, but you can't see these functions very well with the Fourier transform. This, this function typically has very small Fourier coefficients. So the circle method can't see this function, but it plays a big role uh, in this form. So that's why you can't use classical Fourier analysis anymore to attack this problem. Um, so you also have to deal with quadratic phases. Now, the situation is worse than this. Um, there are um, variants of quadratic phases called bracket quadratic phases, which are also bad news. Um, so instead of e to the alpha n squared, um, if you look at um, a phase like this, you, you, take, uh, you take n multiplied by some irrational, say root n, take the integer part of that, um, and then uh, multiply that by another root number times, times n. So you're introducing some some non some slightly nonlinear um, operation here. This is this some integer part operation. So this is no longer exactly quadratic, but it's very close to quadratic because um, this uh, integer part operation, it's kind of uh, fifty percent linear. Um, you know, for example, um, the integer part of x plus y, it's, it's not always the integer part of x, the integer part of y. But actually, half the time when you add two real numbers, you don't carry past the decimal point. And actually, this is true about half the time. Um, and because of this, uh, it turns out that um, uh, typically um, this identity I've written out here, the third difference of this expression, th this expression is close enough to quadratic that it's third derivative, but it's not zero, but it vanishes about, I think, one sixteenth of the time or something. So th there's a positive fraction of the time where, where this expression vanishes. And because of that, that's still enough to make th this function uh, non negligible. It's a little bit more negligible than a quadratic phase, but it's still uh, not negligible. And so any theory that handles that. So, so any um, um, strategy to, to control the lambda four must also see these bracket quadratic objects as well. Um, you can't get around them. Um, now, it turns out that these guys are pretty much the only things that, that show up. Okay, so there is an inverse theorem still. Okay, um, well, a slightly more complicated version of this inverse theorem, this is a typo, this should not be there. Okay, that um, that if you have a function which isn't negligible for this length four count or for this this higher order Gauss norm, then f correlates has a large inner product not with a linear phase which was the um, the, uh, the classical circle method theory, but with what's called a bracket quadratic. Um, oh, and I think I, I, I also missed a, a quadratic phase here as well. That uh, you you will correlate with maybe a quadratic polynomial plus some annoying bracket quadratic terms as well. Okay, so these are the type of objects that that are not negligible. So, so, so anybody that correlates with, with something like this, you can show it is not negligible. And conversely, um, anybody that's not negligible will have a large inner product with, with some expression like this. 
So these are the structured objects. Um, and, and these are the things that, that tell you, I need to use quadratic Fourier analysis. Um, and quadratic Fourier analysis is basically the study of these sort of, of, of expressions. Um, and so, um, and then there's a structure theorem that you can split up any function into a negligible, um, which is negligible in this sense, plus a whole bunch of a finite linear combination of these bracket quadratic phases. And then to, to um, be able to conclude, um, to solve your problem, you need an equidistribution theorem for these sort of objects. Okay. Uh, okay, well, yeah. So uh, let me not just say how you prove this inverse theorem. That's one of the hardest parts of the theory, how you actually prove this inverse theorem. But that I will just skip. Um, but uh, what, end, what you end up needing to finish um, uh, answering various problems in the subject is, is equidistribution theorem. So you, 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 uh, you can ask questions like, you take alpha n, 1, beta n, mod 1, and then many other bracket quadratics. Okay, and you ask, how are these equidistributed? Um, and uh, so previously when we had some a linear phase, it was, it was dis distributed in a, a nice subgroup. It was a very clean algebraic answer. If you attack this problem directly, it's, it's an incredible mess, um, basically because of all the discontinuities, uh, you know, this, this integer part function creates all these jump discontinuities. And so you get this weird piecewise algebraic object, the semi-algebraic um, limit. It, it's, it's, it's quite nasty. Um, and so in order to get um, a sane equi equi distribution theory, uh, what we have, uh, what we've been forced to do, is to rewrite these these funny bracket quadratics in a more algebraic way, and this is where these sort of infamous no sequences come up. Um, so it, it turns out that you can rewrite this this type of bracket quadratics. You, you can rewrite them as some function of an orbit in a, an object called a new manifold. You, you take a nilpotent group like a Heisenberg group. You quotient out by a, a, um, a discrete subgroup, and that, that creates kind of a, a twisted torus. It's, it's, it's like a, um, a, a torus where like, which looks a little, little bit like a Klein bottle um, um, or Mobius strip. And you, uh, you take some polynomial sequence inside this. Yeah, so uh, um, um, you, you have some weird twisted torus. You take some polynomial orbit inside this, this torus. And you apply some some test function to that, and it turns out that you can rewrite um, these bracket quadratics in terms of um, um, orbits on no manifolds, which looks like uh, that doesn't that's not doesn't sound like a great trade because this this looks a lot less explicit. Um, maybe I'll, I think the next slide is one one example of this. Yeah, so uh, just very one basic example, uh, a classic example of the um, of a no manifold is what's called the Heisenberg no manifold. You, you caution out the real Heisenberg group by the discrete Heisenberg group. And if you take this polynomial sequence in the Heisenberg, in the Heisenberg group and you quotient it out, um, if you move this this to a fundamental domain of uh, this no matter this, this no matter looks like a unit cube, which is which is glued together, uh, the sides are glued together in some funny twisted way. Uh, if you actually compute what what the um, representative of this orbit is in the fundamental domain, you get an expression that that involves all these bracket um, polynomials. And so this, this you can kind of see why bracket polynomials are related to no manifolds. Um, but um, but this is this is much more algebraic. Um, once you do things this way, you you don't see these these uh, integer part functions anymore, um, and the equidistribution theory is much nicer. Um, so it turns out that that there is an analog of this um, torus equidistribution theorem. So I said that in a torus, any linear orbit equidistributes in some in in some closed subgroup, uh, and there's a, there's a similar theorem for no manifolds that any polynomial orbit in a no manifold equidistributes into some finite union of, of closed orbits of subgroups, closed subgroups of no manifolds. And because of this, you can kind of reduce these, um, um, if you want to understand what the structured part of, of some average is doing, you, it becomes group theory again. You need to understand what are the closed subgroups of a no, of a no, of a no important group. Um, so uh, um, there, there's some algebraic end game, which I will skip here for lack of time. But you can put all this together, and then you can do things like you, you can count how many progressions of primes there are of k uh, in, uh, in some large number, and you can do many, many other things. But these are sort of the basic tools that are used in high order Fourier analysis. So this is kind of a very whirlwind tour subject. Um, so I will just finish. I'll just mention so all that stuff I just mentioned was from a previous decade, it was 10 years ago. Um, there's a lot of ongoing 
activity in the subject. Um, there's, uh, uh, so I just sort of name drops various things that are going on. Um, this is very nice technique called densification, which allows you to sort of con um, um, uh, approximate in some sense sparse sets such as sets of primes um, by dense sets, uh, sort of like dense sets of integers that, that, that you can, um, you can convert theorems that you already know about dense sets of integers into theorems of sparse set of integers. And so uh, this lets you understand primes in particular quite nicely. Um, there's um, an ongoing direction of research in what are called concatenation theorems that if you have some, if you have some sort of local structure in various directions, can you somehow um, combine them to, to create more globally structured objects? Um, these have sort of have a um, cohomological fuel to them actually. Yeah, so, so group cohomology starts, starts showing up of, of all things. Um, there's this very nice technique of, of degree lowering that Palus and Pendipu uh, introduced that allows you to attack a high complexity problem using lower complexity tools sometimes. Um, and um, these are inverse theorems and equidistribution theorems, they have become much more quantitative. Uh, so the, the, the first few proofs gave almost no bounds whatsoever, um, but now we have a reasonably good bounds um, and, and very recent work um, uh, um, and quite ongoing. Um, and then there's connections to ergodic theory and, and, and there are some slick ways to attack these theorems using the tools of non-standard analysis, um, in, particularly involving these, these objects, which are now called no spaces. Yeah, so there's a lot going on. You can see that, that there's a lot of activity just in the last two years, for instance. Um, but I'm out of time, so I think I will stop there.